I want to begin by telling you about a girl on whom I had a crush back in eighth grade. Her name was Julie. I'd actually known her since third grade. In elementary school, well, I'd say we were never best friends. We always got along well as classmates. But by the end of seventh grade, I realized that with her, I was beginning to feel interested in something maybe a little bit more than simply that. Often with boys, when it comes to girls, what gets their attention has to do with how the latter either look or at least make themselves look outwardly. Sometimes it may be because of the girl in question's charm or her popularity. But for me, with Julie, it was mainly because of something different from all that. It was actually because of a propensity I could sense in her when it came to simple kindness toward others. That's right. Even so, at the age we were at the time. In middle school, we were required to cover our textbooks with craft paper. To this day, I've never understood why. There was a certain way the paper was folded so it would stay on the book. I could never seem to get it quite right. It just kept falling off my books. But I remember how one time before the start of the period of this one class we had together, Julie saw this and came over to my desk to help me so it correctly stayed on. This was just one example. The problem was that I was shy. So all through eighth grade, here I was with this huge crush on her, but I was never quite able to get the courage up. But I think Julie eventually figured it out. Perhaps it was because of the way I'd sometimes blush when she spoke to me. Tan rojo como un tomate. Later in the year, I remember a few times when she seemed just a bit more flirty with me than before. Plus, of course, a few more of her signature gestures of kindness. The summer after eighth grade, my family moved away to another city, and I haven't seen her since. Kindness, the fifth of the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5.22. Miriam Webster's defines the word kind as having or showing a gentle nature and a desire to help others, wanting or liking to do good things and bring happiness to others. The term for kindness in the Greek is Christates, having to do not only with kindness, but integrity, moral excellence in character or demeanor, also gentleness or good. In Hebrew, the term for it is chesed, meaning compassion and faithfulness to one's obligations, relatives, friends, and even slaves. This can be in the form of kind deeds done for another person. In Titus 3, 4 through 7, we read of it as another of God's attributes. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior so that having been justified by his grace, 
we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Consider also Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And also Acts 14, 7. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. God desires kindness toward others on our part as followers of Christ. This is reflected in Jesus' teaching of the comparison between the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, and also of the Good Samaritan, as we read in Luke chapter 10, verses 29 through 37. And again, in Ephesians 4.32, we are called to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ he has forgiven us. Indeed, God's people should possess kindness and not refuse to dispense it to others. In Colossians 3.12, with kindness, just like love, and along with compassion, humility, gentleness, and patience, we are called to put it on like a garment. So in walking and keeping in step with the Spirit, as we seek God according to who we are in Christ, what does kindness look like in your classroom? In what ways does one see it there? What can challenge it? Busyness, pressure for time, stress, or perhaps taking one's own expectations too seriously? I want to share of a personal experience with two professors I had while working on my master's. It was the day of my final review. It was a meeting between myself and several members of the department faculty in order to evaluate a field internship I'd recently completed in Mexico. One of the professors present was part-time. His name is known in the field of the profession, indeed because of his passion and philosophy towards certain ways and means related. However, there were really only a few times I ever saw him on campus. One of these was for a week-long intensive class I took with him not long before I left for my internship. During the class, in response to something I shared about what I was going to be doing in Mexico, this professor said some things but in a tone I found rather critical, and so in a rather flamboyant manner, all of it right there in front of the class. I was both startled and embarrassed by it. About a year later, during my final review, this same professor again sort of put me on the spot with a few more critical remarks of this kind. Afterward, he gave me his email address, indicating a wish to continue to interact with me. However, by my own choice, I never took him up on it. Perceiving his matter-of-fact to grace ratio as a ways to go from 50-50, my ability to trust him had taken just a bit of a hit. However, at the same meeting, 
was another of my professors, Dr. Smith. With him, I'd actually had a couple of courses. He had a gentler and more soft-spoken way about him. His investment in my classmates and I was really beyond the classroom. I'd say he really made it more of a point to listen to us and know our hearts. For a time, some of us actually got to live with him and his wife. Much of what I learned from really both Dr. and Mrs. Smith was more informal. For example, through discussions around the dinner table. And we are still in touch today. When it comes to kindness, are there any questions as to who would have had the greater impact? The Smiths always cared enough to be honest, but also enough to be kind about it, to go about things in a way that was always gentle and gracious. Because of it, they earned the right to be heard, because they invested the time to be a little bit more to us than just classroom teachers, and to build in a bit more relationship-wise. This is why I will always value them and what they had to say as friends and mentors. Again, this was an experience I had while working on my master's. As for the first professor, I'd say I dealt with him as graciously as any adult must when dealing with a lack of kindness on the part of another. But think about it. Exactly how graciously might something as such be received at the level at which you teach? It was teacher Lori Gard who wrote these words. It's about being there for your kids. Because at the end of the day, most students won't remember what amazing lesson plans you've created. They won't remember how organized your bulletin boards are, how straight and neat are the desk rows, or if you've gone deskless, how straight and neat the chairs. No, they'll not remember the amazing decor you've designed, but they will remember you your kindness, your empathy, your care and concern. They'll remember that you took the time to listen, that you stopped to ask them how they were, how they really were. They'll remember the personal stuff you share about your life, your home, your pets, your kids. They'll remember your laugh, They'll remember that you sat and talked with them while they ate their lunch. Because at the end of the day, what really matters is you. You are that difference in their lives. In a fairly recent study at the University of Edinburgh, Dr. Gail McLeod and others identified 12 significant examples of how a teacher can demonstrate ways in which students feel kindness. These included fostering a sense of belonging or community, getting to know students personally, supporting their academic success, including verbally communicating high expectations with students, expressing positive statements to encourage student effort, monitoring and assisting students during learning activities, and individualizing learning outcomes, responding to students' needs by supplying the necessary resources, individualizing learning outcomes, responding to students' needs by supplying the necessary resources, knowing students by name, displaying care and concern during office hours, knowing and understanding students, 
creating interesting and applicable lessons, addressing student concerns during course time, expressing care verbally and non-verbally, and finally, projecting a feeling of care or creating such a feeling in the overall learning environment. How might any of these fit into your modus operandi? God shows us kindness by caring for us. For instance, by providing us with people like Julie and the Smiths. He provides food for us and fills our hearts with joy. He also showed us his love by sending his son, Jesus. When we are kind to both our students and others, it is a good way to share God's love with them. Kindness can happen with proactive effort. In fact, through proactive effort is really the only way it can happen. But it need not be elaborate. It can even be done in but little and simple ways that may only take a moment. For us as teachers, indeed world language teachers, it really has to do with having not just a passion about your language, but a passion for those to whom you teach it. Very much indeed. That's a passion for your learners and for kindness. 